All right, team, welcome aboard. It's Amar again, and uh, thanks for joining us. Jill, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, hi, I'm so excited to be here today. We have a, a short amount of time to cover a lot of important things. And we also have quite a mix of uh, folks on the webinar attending. So we have uh, individual contributors in the sales organization, sales enablement professionals, sales leaders, and uh, marketing professionals. So uh, hopefully everyone will walk away with uh, one nugget or more than one nugget from today's session. Uh, what we're going to cover today is the fact that sales and marketing alignment is a hot topic and becoming increasingly more important um, as the transformation of the buyer continues to happen. We're going to talk about how salespeople can leverage content. Uh, content is the currency of the modern marketer, but it's also the currency of the social salesperson. I teach salespeople how to read what their buyers read and share that content across their social networks. We'll talk a lot about the role of content in social selling. We're also going to cover the mindset. Nobody wants to be sold but everyone wants help. And the mindset of the modern sales professional is one who helps her buyer, helps her buyer not just buy, but helps her buyer solve her business problem, reach her business objectives. So that mindset of helping and not always be closing, always be selling, selly, selly. The skill set, your buyers are digital and social, your salespeople need to be too. Networking via the social web is a whole different animal than networking face to face and then the required toolkit. There's a lot of tools out there to help with amplifying uh, social selling and accelerating adoption of social selling, but a fool with a tool is still a fool. So don't start with the, don't start with the tool. Applying old school tactics to new school channels will not produce the result that you're looking for. So we'll talk about the mindset, the skill set, and the toolkit required. So why are we here? What, what, has, what has changed in, uh, in, in, in the world that we're having to actually talk about transformation in sales? The buyer. The buyer has changed more in the past 10 years than in the past 100. The modern buyer, she's digitally driven. 92% of B2B buyers start their search on the web and 67% of the buying process is being done digitally. Salespeople are being replaced by search engines and social networks, specifically and particularly in the early stage of the buyer's journey. The modern buyer is socially connected. We've never had more access to each other than we have today via platforms and networks like LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. There are no geographic boundaries in social, and social never sleeps on 24-7. We're mobile with multiple devices. I sit here with my Mac, my iPhone, my iPad. I have multiple devices. I always have access to not only information, but to people. And that means the modern buyer is empowered. But with all of this, we can't forget that the modern buyer is also overwhelmed with distractions and interruptions. Um, and so we have to remember that this buyer is empowered but also overwhelmed. And how do we actually help the buyer? So let's move forward to the next slide. Here's the thing. The lines between marketing and sales are blurring. And really, the the, the perfect handoff of a marketing qualified lead to sales, this isn't, this isn't the world in which the buyer is living. The buyer is out there self-educating, having a learning party without sales, consuming content. Sales wants to be able to get in earlier and be able to shape demand. The lines are blurring and the roles are blending. And the reality is that now, Marketing needs to know more about sales. Sales needs to know more about marketing. But we all need to know more about our customers. We all need to know more about our buyers. And if there's one hashtag to summarize what the power of social networks give to sales professionals is hashtag know thy buyer. 
it's not just who you know, it's what you know about who you know, and social networks provide so much information and insight about a buyer, about their needs, about their identity, about their relationships, about their interests. Social networks provide that information about your buyers. Know thy buyer. We'll move forward. So Jill, let's actually, yeah, let's go yeah to Amar, please. So folks, we're gonna launch a poll question on your screen right now. And I'm actually driving the machine, so if you see my mouse moving around, apologies in advance. But uh, here's the first poll question launching on your screen right now. Where is your organization on the path to social selling? So you should see that on your screen right now. We're gonna give you about a minute to answer. But Jill, let's talk about, while folks are answering, let's talk about where you feel organizations are today with social. Yeah, I mean, I basically am our every day, all day, I get to consume content about social selling. I get to read the research reports from the analysts like Forrester, Serious Decisions, CEB, Aberdeen, IDC. So I get to consume all of the content from the Smarty Pants analysts. I also get to read ebooks and white papers and infographics. I get to attend webinars. I get to listen to podcasts. Um, I get to actually speak with companies that are on the journey. Um, and, and, and from all of this, uh, we're early days. We are still early days in social selling, in particular from looking at it from a corporate initiative and looking at it from a cross-functional initiative of looking at, okay, we've got to bring sales, marketing, sales enablement, sales training together to to really tackle the mindset, the skill set, and the toolkit of a social selling organization. Really well said. And and Jill, I've closed the poll, folks, so thanks for participating. Let's look at the answers on your screen right now. So it, it pleases me because if this was 12 months ago, this middle category of 53% of you saying that some of your sales reps are dabbling in social, this is massive. This technically did not exist even a year ago. So Super happy about that. And for the 25% of you that have got plans for a rollout, I want you to start conceptualizing and getting uh, wrapped around this concept of sales and marketing alignment. Because as you've got plans for a rollout, sales training is clearly the call of the day. But I want you to start thinking about what your marketing team can do. So I, I hope you walk away with a couple of neat nuggets uh, around um, how you can get marketing better involved to enable that social process. So Jill, that's a, that was a good poll question. I'm glad we launched that. So let's do this. Let me hide that from your screen, everyone. And what I'm going to do right now is uh, move forward. You know, I love to talk about this concept of disruption because it's happening in front of our eyes. And all the major analyst houses, all of the major research firms are, are saying this. Now, the most important data point to me on this slide is the one from Corporate Visions. And I think this is a data, you know, if you're a sales leader on this call, perhaps, or if you're a sales individual contributor, this data point should not surprise you in the least. Because we know that salespeople that are first to add value and insight end up winning the deals. This study proves that, that it happens three out of four times. So think about the disconnect here. If you're in an organization where cold calling and emailing, which are not going away, by the way, nor should they, but if you're in an organization that heavily and only relies on those two modes of outreach, think about the disconnect because our buyers are online, they're mobile, socially connected, empowered, all of those groovy things that Jill just mentioned, but your buyers aren't waiting for people to reach out to them by phone. So quotas keep going up every year. No sales rep ever says to us that quotas have gone down. Quotas keep going up every year, but the number of people that they're connecting with, your sales reps, keeps going down. So disruption is happening and it's all buyer led. I, I fully agree with Jill. I, I want to- Amar, yes. real quickly, as you move to this next slide, which I love this graphic, um, I wish we had a poll question. How many of the attendees like to receive cold calls? Great question. How many of the attendees like to receive generic unsolicited emails from people they don't know. And inevitably, I, I would guess it's 
it's one or none, but we, you know, companies, sales VPs are running the call, email, call, email, call, email, call, e email play, and the buyers are going ignore, delete, ignore, delete, ignore, delete, ignore, delete. The old model, you know, a numbers game, more calls, more opportunities to connect isn't working. So if you, I want you to walk through this slide, but but the, the smile and dial, the pounce and pitch, the old sales model, ain't gonna cut it anymore. Yeah, it's, 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 I'm not sure if it's dead, but it's certainly dying. And, and for everyone on the call, I'll share a personal story with you. I recently spoke to the CEO of a major Canadian company with about a thousand to 1100 salespeople. And um, he just let his VP of sales go. He's not happy with marketing's effort. I'm sure there's gonna be moves there. And, and Jill, his answer to me when I asked, what are you planning to do to change this to actually hit targets? Because he was responsible, they're a public company. He said to me, I'm going to have my salespeople do more cold calls. So yeah, clearly the, it, the old sales model, folks, it, it's not cutting it anymore. I think it's plain as day. We don't need to beat this horse, right? But I think the new sales model also is, is starting to make an impact. For those of you that have reps dabbling in social, I congratulate you, kudos, because ultimately you're recognizing and feeling the shift yourself. I think this is a groundswell thing. If you're an individual sales contributor on this call, you'll realize exactly what I'm talking about. It's becoming increasingly difficult to get in touch with buyers. We're moving from the world where it was buyer beware to the model of seller beware. Right, Daniel Pink talks about this excessively in one of his books, Caveat Vendator, where really sellers need to be uh, cognizant of how much control buyers have. The result of all of this is that there is a shift happening from a classic linear sales process where we herd prospects like cattle through a ranch to a buying journey that is so high level, every individual's buying journey is unique. How are we going to contend with this in sales? And this is a topic I personally feel no one or not enough people are talking about. This is, if it sounds like I'm you know, sounding the alarm folks, it's because I am. Because ultimately buyers are in the seat of control and we're not waking up to that reality. The disconnect then of why we're all here is because buyers are more social, right? And sellers aren't. So while your buyers are online, engaging on Twitter, LinkedIn, Googling things, they're going to vertical networks like Spiceworks for IT, for instance, your sellers are reaching out by phone and email. While there's active, vivid, colorful conversations happening online, sellers are not exposed to this because they're not trained effectively in how to mine gold in the social space. That is what's at stake. And I'll, and I'll leave you with one data point before I you pass it back to Jill. This was a study conducted by LinkedIn. I want all of you to pay attention here. LinkedIn asked 1,500 B2B buyers a simple question. What attributes do you look for in your desired sales professional? And the number one answer that's come back is someone that's known as a thought leader in their industry. Now, the term thought leader to all the non-marketers on the call may not mean like much. So let me interchange that with the following terms we claim every single day. Terms like, I'm a social selling expert, or I'm a thought leader, or I'm a specialist, or here's the best one, I'm a trusted advisor. You see, you might be those things, and it's great that you are, but your buyers don't know that about you, because where they're starting their journey, and where you're trying to express your trusted advisorship, those two aren't matching anymore. So I think that's what's at stake as well. Jill, I'll kick it back to you. Yeah, I want to talk about trust. And this is an annual study done by Edelman. And essentially what's happened, because the buyer now has more access to more information and more objective, independent people than they've ever had before, they don't have to trust the information that they get from the sales professional or from your marketing messages nearly to the extent that they used to rely on those, those sources of information. And I always say your best salespeople aren't on your payroll. So your true. best salespeople are your customers who are willing to advocate because they've had such a great customer experience 
They're willing to advocate for your product or service. They're willing to advocate for your company. And they're willing to advocate for your people. And really, we don't, I hate the word prospect. I just think it's old school. And I definitely hate hunting and farming for customers and buyers. But I think not of them as prospects. I think of them as future advocates. Um, and, and I treat them as such. And I'm, I'm really focused on how do I help them um, what, with whatever they're trying to accomplish and, and really understanding thy buyer. So trust is, 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 is we're living in a different world of, of trust. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Jill. Uh, it, and it's so well said because people are just not buying the message from brands anymore. No, I, here's let me give you some very specific examples because I, I mean, we're being high level, but who's educating the buyer? I, I get this magazine called B two B Marketer. It's published by A and A and B M A, and on the cover of the fall issue is. CMO John Kennedy on transforming a 109-year-old brand, the new Xerox. I'm in conversations with Xerox about speaking at their sales kickoff meeting and about, I've actually introduced um, Xerox to Sales for Life and they're having conversations with Amar and team about uh, bringing in Sales for Life Social Selling Mastery Program, which is all about training. So in this old school print magazine. I actually really like to get print still. I, there's this layout of this interview with John Kennedy and he's talking about the five best practices of Xerox. And number two is marketing must increase selling capacity, making sales a partner in everything they do. Number four is thinking long but always stopping looking and listening and be willing to adapt along the way. And, and the, the content in this interview absolutely aligns to why Xerox should be investing big time in social selling. Content is the core to their new brand strategy and it needs to be the core to their new sales strategy. And so I read this article and then I share the article via my social networks tagging John Kennedy, the CMO of Xerox, and other people at Xerox who I'm in conversation with. That's to be interesting, be interested. To be interesting to John Kennedy and the team at Xerox, I need to be interested in them. I need to show them that I know about their business, that I understand their priorities. And so by sharing that kind of content, I now earn the right to start educating Xerox on social selling. Who's educating the buyer? They're out there self-educating. And you want to be connected to the people who are educating your customers. And you want to be um, sharing their content and, and, and have relationships with the people who are influencing your customers. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really well said. I think salespeople don't do enough um, work around doing proper research, Jill. I think that is so obvious, but it's fundamentally lacking. You know, I want to jump into the role of sales and marketing around content because content is currency, as Jill said. And I, and I give you an interesting and very cartoony diagram here, but it really just shows you how tactically sales and marketing can start to align. And again, folks, this is a 30,000 foot view. If you're interested in learning more, if you want to chat about this further, I'm a geek for this stuff. Feel free to reach out at any time. But this is you know, this is sales for life, actually. This is our model. This is us creating the Insights Factory. For those of you that follow us, you might have noticed how much content we put out. Well, imagine this is me on the left-hand side, this little gray person here in sales, and the right person here on the right is our marketing folks, right? Now, what I'm doing in the sales capacity is I'm bringing buyer feedback, valuable buyer feedback to the fore. I'm sharing that IP into marketing Marketing is then using that to generate powerful insights, research, analysis, etc., and then we're sharing that back into the market through insight distribution. And this feedback loop is so simple, yet it's incredible to see that this simple act is not done at most companies. Now, again, this is a 30,000 foot view. There's many creative ways of doing this, but this, is, uh, this gives you a picture as to how you can get started 
with sales and marketing insights. Feel free to watch the recording to grab a screenshot of this because I, I really do feel it's that important. Now, I want to dive into you know, the long-term play here. What's really at stake? And this is a great study done by Jeremy Miller of Sticky Branding. So I've taken this image from him. You know, Jeremy's research is very extensive and he identifies that roughly 3% of buyers at any moment in time are actually interested in what you have to sell. And by interested, I mean they're active, they've got budget. Basically, Bant slash Anim is there, it's qualified, they're ready to spend. 7% just below there intend to change. Now, this top 10% category, this is the salesperson's golden dream. This is where they want to play. This is where conversations are the sexiest. This is where conversations are alive. This is where salespeople feel that they're adding a considerable amount of value. But if you look at your long-term pipeline implications, I believe that sales needs to now do the bottom 30 and the, and the stack below that as well. The 30% that don't have a need right now and the 30% who have a need but aren't yet ready to act. If we can start engaging with these people where they're starting their buying journey, i.e. digital, social, mobile, online, etc., then think about the impact this has on your pipe because remember that stat from Corporate Visions, 74% of buyers will choose to work with the salesperson that was first to add value. I really feel that if marketing and sales align correctly and share insights, this is the benefit in the long term. Joe, I'll, I'll kick it back to you. Yeah, thanks, Amar. Actually, um, I, I, again, I have to cite another very specific example. Um, Brandon Iring, I don't know if I got your name pronounced correctly, but thank you so much for all your activity on Twitter during the presentation today. Um, you know, I read your, your bio in Twitter and it says, future VP of sales at a billion dollar company. And this morning when I was at the gym, I was listening to a podcast interview with Byron Dieter on the 10 laws of building a billion dollar SaaS company. Um, that's the kind of content that I would actually share with you via Twitter. Um, because I'm not, I, I'm trying to build a relationship with you, so I'm not trying to pitch you on social selling now. I'm trying to get your attention to be interesting, be interested. And if you want to build a billion dollar company, I just listened to a brilliant podcast on how to build a billion dollar company. Um, so that's, that's what I'm trying to get sales professionals and marketers to think about is, is the content, um, yes, and, and if we move forward in the slide deck, the, the focus areas for modern marketers, yes, I totally agree with leading with the buying journey. Um, the buyer's journey, the customer journey, and understanding where the buyer is in the buying process. In, in fact, um, you know, Mar, we were talking about Sales for Life's content, and you guys do a, an incredible job creating content on the why do companies need to invest in social selling. So, so getting their attention, understanding the shifts. But where, where I think Sales for Life, I've been counseling you guys to cre create more content, is around why training, right? You're a training company. So why do you need to train your salespeople, and why do you need a blended learning environment? So why training, why training from Sales for Life, that's the, that's the whole buyer's journey and, and aligning content to not only the journey but the, but the role. So again, I'll state we have many different people on the call, sales, sales frontline salespeople who are actually, you know, have their revenue number. We've got sales leaders who own the roll-up number and have to think more broadly about the whole team and the cultural differences and the age and demographic differences and the territory differences. We've got sales enablement people, sales training and marketing. So the buyer persona also. So content that is aligned to the buyer's journey, the buyer persona, but then content that is just darn right helpful and interesting to the specific individual with whom you're trying to build a relationship with. Absolutely. We're running out of time, so I'd like to move to the next slide. Empowering sales with insights. Uh, you know, I spent 10 years at Eloqua as an individual quota carrying sales rep. I have the benefit that my buyer was marketing, hence why I know a ton about modern B2B marketing, because I knew my buyer. Hashtag know thy buyer. Um, what, I, what I got from um, using tools and technology, I was able to get insight into my buyer's digital body language. I was able to see what content they were consuming, what 
ebooks they were downloading, what webinars they were attending. I was able to get insight into my buyers' interests and activities, emails that they were opening, clicking through, apologies for the dog in the background. Um, I was able to get insight, not just into the content consumption, but also to the social activity. Um, so I, I highly in, in encourage anyone who's invested in marketing automation, take a look at what sales enablement tools are available as an add-on to that, because there's, there's probably a ton of functionality in your marketing automation system that you're not leveraging to provide sales the insight that, that they need to know who to call, when to call them, and what to say based on their digital body language, based on their content consumption story. Yeah, and, and that content consumption story today is, I think it, it's liquid gold. It is, and 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 the, the the knowing, then you start to look at the analytics around content consumption, and you start to see what percentage of your potential buyers, how many, what's the average number of pieces of content that they consumed before they made a phone call, before they submitted a contact me form, before they. Um, took a, a demo meeting, whatever it is, you start to really be able to use data and analytics to understand you know, that content consumption story and how that maps to your percentage likelihood to win them as a customer. In terms of content creation, um, I, I'm all about you know, marketing producing buyer-centric uh, content, content that is edutaining, that is visually appealing, that is shareable. So, guess what? Nobody wants to share your product data sheet on Twitter. It's not going to happen. So content that is, is shareable and engaging. When marketing is creating this content, having the input from sales on what they need based on getting buyers to the next stage in the buying journey, that's a really critical component of creating this content, not in a vacuum, but with collaboration from sales. What kind of content does sales need to get buyers further through their buying journey? Don't create content in a vacuum. And I, I want to make sure I, I'm not a real advocate of sales creating own original content. That's not usually their, their core skill set. But I'm a huge fan in sales uh, using curated content, other people's content, um, thought leader, third party, uh, analyst content sharing other people's content to, to, to fuel their, their social sharing. Absolutely. And Jill, just one last point on that. The ability for a salesperson, if you're on this call and you're in sales as an individual contributor, you might be a sales leader. If you're wondering for the core reason why you need to do this, aside from, of course, you know, being interesting and being interested, it's because every time you share content, it generates engagement. That engagement is essentially qualification. You've, when you share a piece of content and you say, I love basketball, do you? And five people like it. You don't need to wonder how many of your 1,000 LinkedIn connections may have an interest in basketball. They've clearly expressed it. This gives you insights into reaching out, having much more targeted, relevant, and contextual conversations. So you're not just reading, you know, reaching out blindly with standard cookie cutter email templates or cold call templates that you may use on scripts. This is now about making the conversation about the buyer. Uh, I'm just going to go forward here. Let's talk about and let's wrap up with, you know, what's at stake? Why should we be doing all of this? And I really believe that this is about and folks, keep in mind, I'm going to say something controversial here. So let me launch this on screen right now. You know, here's what's at stake. Th this is John Chambers, of course, the outgoing CEO of Cisco, a legend in the business industry. And, and Mr. Chambers stood in front of 25,000 people at his July partner conference and said to them that 40% of you will not be around in 10 years. And the reason is because you are fearing embracing digital. Because the buyer's digital, we must change. So I really believe that status quo and the way we keep doing things is going to have to change. And folks, if you need an example, look at the Dow Jones. Look at the top 30 stocks that comprise the Dow Jones index. And then look at that list 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and 30 years ago. It will be radically different because the companies that refused to disrupt themselves got disrupted out of the market. So I leave you with that. I really think that status quo is your worst enemy. 
So that br brings us to a close. I want to wrap up with one more poll question. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to launch that poll question on your screen right now. And we'd just like to know which of the following best describes your reaction after watching this presentation. Of course, we strive to bring you great content, timely content, content that inspires you and motivates you to act. So take some time. This is essentially, you know, an entire feedback form in one question. So take your time, please answer that, and then we'll wrap up. And for those of you um, and, and your peers and your colleagues and friends that couldn't attend, don't forget this is being recorded and the recording will be sent out uh, very soon. So look out for that as well. Yeah, Amar, I'll just state too while people are responding. We went really quickly, 33 minutes. Um, we, we barely scratched the surface, right? So there is so much that uh, needs to be covered as it relates to social selling from an individual contributor perspective, from a sales enablement and sales training perspective, from a sales leadership perspective, from a marketing perspective, even from a hiring perspective, from a recruiting and hiring the, the, the modern sales professional. Um, so there's, there's lots more to learn. Um, we tried to, to hit the points around aligning sales and marketing to, with, for, and around the customer, hashtag know thy buyer, and being able to use social networks to learn more about your buyers. And folks, I'm sharing the results with you. 2% of you had some oh no moments, which is good. I'm glad you were not uh, being honest with me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but 83% of you, thank you for walking away with some tangible ideas. You know, use Jill and I as resources. Of course, you know what we do and how we think about this topic. There is our Twitter handle. Reach out on Twitter. Reach out on LinkedIn. Send invites. Let's get connected. Remember, social selling is here. It's not going away much to the dismay of many old school folks, the traditionalists, I call them, it's here. So thanks again for your time, folks. I hope you enjoyed that. Jill, thanks again for joining. Yeah, absolutely, Amar. I just, you know, again, know thy buyer, um, be visible and relevant to your buyer. And if your buyer's in social, your salespeople need to be there too. Thanks, folks. Have a great day. Take care.